This is the Gambling Gauchos. Hey! If we keep playing and fighting for each other, and no matter what happens, we just say, what's next? That's all we do! Somebody turn on some damn music! You're listening to the Gambling Gauchos. Talking Texas Tech. Betting on the Big 12 and beyond. We've got everything you need. Money lines, memes, and matadors. Well, you want to quit, Ethan? That'll be the day. Now, here's Kyle Jacobson and Rob Bro. The Money Line Matadors. The Casino Cowboys. The Parlay Picadors. You see, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Those with loaded guns, and those who dig. You dig. With the Gambling Gauchos. Oh, and one more thing. It's all West Texas. It always has been. Welcome in on the Gambling Gauchos. I'm Rob Rowe. He's Kyle Jacobson. Patrick Mahomes is a two-time, two-time Super Bowl MVP, Super Bowl champion. The Kansas City Chiefs beat the Philadelphia Eagles 38-35. We're live in the Cardinals Sports Center studios. You can gear up for Texas Tech baseball season at Cardinals, mycardinalsports.com, or live and in person, 68th-ish in Slide, Lubbock, Texas. You probably get some stuff in Plano, too. We prefer the Lubbock, uh, well, I guess Kyle now, closer to the Plano location. You have to go check him out, Kyle. If you go into the Plano location, you think they'll know who you are? No. <laughs> no, no chance. <laughs> Uh, they know us at the uh, the Lubbock location, though. Great guys over there. Kyle, how you doing, man? It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Glad to see you are feeling better. Man, that was rough. I need to uh, meme you on that. I lived text. Meme. Yeah, <laughs> I need to take a selfie. Yeah. I lived. <laughs> I've not been that sick in years. I, I don't know yeah. what was going on. I I didn't even even through uh, the Rona. I never never tested positive for the Rona. But I was down bad this week. Still feel uh still still feel a little under the weather, but we're we're getting there. Feeling healthy. I feel fantastic. Drinking some Patrick liquids. Mahomes well, is a two time Super Bowl MVP. That helps. And uh I didn't uh I I didn't know that that was gonna go well until about the third quarter. No, yeah, the first half kind of played out like I feared it would, where they like couldn't get off the field on third down and the Eagles, you know, move the ball really effectively. I was like, and the ankle did not look good before the half. Like we, we didn't get to see him, you know, apparently recover from that. And so I was like, this could be really bad if we're about to watch like Chad Henney versus Jalen Hurts. And really the defense didn't do much better in the second half, but they did just enough. And uh, man, they just... We should we should have learned our lesson by now with the Chiefs that just because they go down double digits in the postseason game doesn't mean anything. Um, but I was worried, and they proved the doubters wrong once again. Two Super Bowl championships, twice they've been down 10 points in the second half. Um, down 10 in the fourth quarter against the 49ers. And uh, you're right, the, the Chiefs defense didn't do a whole lot, but they did hold them to a field goal in the red zone and then force a punt. That was enough. Yeah, and they—I uh, I didn't think they were actually playing that bad. Like some of those completions to Goddard, and oh yeah, like it was in just an insanely small window. And like you can call it a good throw. I think it's a a brave throw. And I guess to Hurts' credit, you know, he put it right where it needed to be. But I was like, man, they're on a lot of these. They're in position that bombed AJ Brown. Like the DB was right there. He just didn't track the ball that well. So I was getting super frustrated. I was like, I don't really think the Eagles are just out scheming them or anything too badly. Um, you know, they're in position to make plays; they're just not quite making them. But then, yeah, the second half, they just the Chiefs 
I, I, I don't think they punted in the second half. Didn't turn the ball over. No, they scored on every so, possession. Yeah, really impressive. This and is... then they flashed the stats that like Mahomes didn't really play that well in his first two Super Bowls. Like obviously did enough to win one, and the second one versus the Bucks was probably a little bit deflated. Like I think he played better than his stats showed, but then this 100%, one it was just yeah. like the stats were there, the eye test was there. Um, really, really cool accomplishment for him to get that second one as young as he is, and you know, in terms of his legacy and everything, the foundation is certainly there. He's got what five, six. Uh, AFC West Division Championships. Five. Has not been eliminated uh, prior to at least overtime of the AFC Championship game in all postseason appearances. And then two Super Bowl wins in three appearances. And I think he's about to turn 27 or maybe just turn 27. He's 27. He started a Broncos game his rookie year. Does he get an AFC West Championship for that? (laughs) Well, I thought this was his sixth... No, I guess so. The season starts 2018 was when he started, but that yeah. season ended in 2019. So, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, that, okay. they've they've been to five straight AFC Championship games. Yeah, yeah. So that's but that's three Super Bowl appearances, two wins, and you, you don't want to have a losing record in Super Bowls. So I thought right. I yeah. thought that was a really big win for obviously for the Chiefs, but for Patrick as well. Now the question is. Uh, does Andy Reid retire after facing his former team? Uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. That that seems to be a, a sunset riding moment for him. I was this close to just being done with Andy Reid when they when Kadarius Tony <laughs> returned that punt inside the five or whatever. Yeah, and on second and goal they ran that little whirly bird. I was like, just run your freaking offense! Like you've yes. been handed this outstanding opportunity to go up at least eight, and it's. It, I, that's always been my gripe with Andy Reid. It's just it gets too, too cute. cute. Yeah, and I was like, you have to settle for a field goal on this drive because of that play call. And hey, when it works, you can't really say anything. But I was like, is he really about to choke away another postseason appearance where you know it's all right in front of him? So to his credit, he got his second win. They said he was the 14th coach to win a, a second Super Bowl. Did it against his former team. And yeah, maybe maybe that's his crowning achievement, and he doesn't want to come back again. I don't know. Is he the second coach to win a Super Bowl with two different teams? Bill Andy Par- Reid. Bill Parcells, the first. Andy Reid didn't win one with two separate oh, teams. Oh, that's right. He didn't ever win one with the Eagles. He got there, didn't win one. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is going to sound like semantics a little bit. Uh, Big Hint says the Eagles' offense is really good. To be honest. The Eagles' offense is incredibly efficient. I, I don't know if they're a great offense. I, I was when, thinking when they about are it, on time and on schedule, they are really efficient. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Uh, I haven't looked at any of these numbers yet, but kind of like learning more about analytics and stuff. There was a point during the college football season where I saw that, like, rush success rate was mentioned. I was like, I don't really know what that means. Like, I could sort of infer what a successful run is versus not. But, you know, it has an explicit definition or parameter. Their success rate running the ball has to be, like, 95%. On those third yeah. and one, fourth and one, they, every time. Well, the so, the quarterback sneak number is ridiculous. Oh. What were they, 12 for 12 today on the I, QB sneak? <laughs> and they have a really good roster. But I just, man, if if they can keep this offensive line together, if Jason Kelsey comes back, this defense has a lot of pieces that are going to be moving in the offseason. Um, the Chiefs have been incredible in two different ways now, uh, with Tyreek Hill and without. And defensively, they have a like a brand new defense from the first time they won to now. A lot of new pieces, a lot of rookies. They've hit on a bunch of draft picks. Uh, can the uh, Eagles do the same? I've got a question for you in that vein. First of all, the Eagles, kind of like the Chiefs, have a ton of pass catchers. Uh-huh. Like They've got three backs that can catch the ball out of the backfield. They've got a good tight end in Goddard. And they had probably like at least four or five wide receivers who caught passes today. Who's the best wide receiver, since Travis Kelsey's a tight end, who's the best wide receiver the Chiefs had this year? 
Ju- Juju? Wide receiver? Yeah. J- Juju? I mean, <laughs> Sky Moore, Kadarius Tony are gimmicks. They're good, but they're not down the field wide receivers. Um, Here's where I'm going with it. Who's the last team to win the Super Bowl with a best receiver as good as or worse than Juju Smith-Schuster? And I know that Travis Kelsey kind of negates the heart of what I'm getting at because he's right. basically a wide receiver in a lot of ways. But like, who, even with the evolution of the tight end position, rosters like the 49ers who have Kittle, they also have Debo and Ayuk. But like after Tyreek Hill left, there was like no juice at the wide receiver spot on this roster. Right. Is it is it Dion Branch? And he was pretty good. Well, he's a Super Bowl MVP, but the, the, that that was the whole thing that. To, uh, Brady did it. Brady made everybody good because Branch went That's elsewhere a, and was awful. It's probably yeah. It's got to be one of those Brady teams that had no dudes at wide receiver. Well, I was just trying to oh. go back. De- Debo, uh, not Debo. <laughs> Cooper Cup last year, and then I guess Mike Evans. Oh yeah, like well, even like Chris Godwin on that roster. Yeah. Chris Godwin would be the best receiver the Chiefs have by far. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go back and look at prior Super Bowl. Um, is it Doug Baldwin? Who, who is the, I, I would take him over Juju. Who was the Patriots wide receiver when they beat the Rams? That was a pretty thin roster. In 2018 they, or whatever Yeah, because they just ran the ball all offseason. Yeah. Uh, was it Edelman, but was he still – was he healthy? Yeah, I don't remember. I'd have to look that one. That might be it. Um, anyway, I'll do that research later tonight and do like a start pinch cut of the three worst receivers to be the best receiver on their team and win the Super Bowl. They just they have so many weapons though. And and Pacheco, I, I was talking about. We were you know at a Super Bowl party and I was talking to uh, the guy. The Cowboys are paying $20 million potentially to Pollard and Zeke next year if they re-sign Pollard. And Pacheco's out here willing them to a Super Bowl really good down the stretch, and he was a seventh-round pick, sixth-round pick? Yeah, seventh. Why, why, why? If you have a good offensive line and a good scheme, why would you ever pay? And I, I, would, not, I would not re-sign Pollard. I know this is not a Cowboys thing, but just... <laughs> Looking at the Chiefs and how they've done it twice, focus on focus on the defense early, focus on the front seven, draft, 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 draft offensive linemen, trust your grades, and get guys that make your quarterback better. Yeah, I I agree 100%. I don't think any NFL team should draft a running back high unless you just have legitimately no other need. Right. Which is so rare in the salary cap era. Like, you can shore up a position group, even if your roster is stacked. Like, um, but yeah, all, all these teams go draft somebody in the fourth round, the sixth round, and he's like replacement level versus w- whatever Pro Bowler wanted. You know, twenty million a year. It's like, why on earth would you pay any of these guys? You can draft some rookie out of yeah. Ball State in the fifth round. And he'll be a serviceable running back if your scheme is good and your line is good. And, and defensively, if Tyron Matthew wants top safety money, get rid of him and trade for Jordan Reed and draft five rookies. I mean, they had a bunch of rookies on the yeah. defensive backfield. Carl Loftus was a was a good uh, young guy. Bolton and uh, Willie Gay are are young linebackers that have been there for two or three years now. So, man, the Chiefs front office. The, the Chiefs, Andy Reid, I think, right now is the best coach in the NFL. Um, Belichick, obviously, has done it and been there a long time, but without Brady, he does not have a lot of success. Um, best quarterback, best front office, best coach, and the Chiefs have won two out of three. Mm-hmm. Or th- two out of five. Um, two out of four. I, I did not think... Uh... Two out of four, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll get it right sometime. I, didn't, I did not think with the departure of Tyree Kill that they would be this good. And they flashed the stats pregame. They have, like, more points per game, more receiving yards per game. All of, like, they went up in every statistical category 
without a dynamic weapon like him. And I just I thought that he and Kelsey complemented each other so well that you know without him I was kind of worried what that was going to look like. And so you know they not to harp on this point too much, but they still have room to grow at wide receiver if they wanted to land like a free agent or trade this offseason for somebody a little more dynamic than Marquez Valdez Scantling. Um, and now they might've done that with Tony. He wasn't like fully integrated into the offense this year. I think he's always been viewed as a really explosive guy who has potential as a playmaker. You saw it on that punt return, but, but yeah, I, I think their roster's in a good spot to, to keep them a contender for years to come. And as far as dynasty talk goes, they asked Mahomes after the game, like, is this a dynasty now? And he said, no, I won't call it a dynasty yet. I think you and I have talked about this before. You need three in a, in a set amount of time to be a dynasty. So I think if they win one of the next two and they're at three out of six at that point, then I, I think you could start having those types of discussions. Uh, big Hint says, but if you can win a Super Bowl with okay wide receiver play, why go pay for a big name? Because you have the capital. And I think you're you're the exception to the rule. Like the yeah. wide receiver position is so important in today's game. Like, yeah, you were able to somehow do it without a an absolute stud at wide receiver, but most of the really good teams in the NFL have at least one, if not two or three, really, really, really good pass catchers. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins allegedly going to get traded kind of at the twilight of his career. Yeah. Uh, you're also getting to a point where um, – Mahomes in this roster is going to be a destination for guys signing free agent deals. I'm not saying this guy's going to sign with the Chiefs, but like OBJ, like some of these older guys who are just chasing rings at this point, you're going to see the kind of the 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 Kobe era Lakers where you get Carl Malone and all these guys at the end of their career yep. try to go get a ring with Kobe. Uh, you're going to see that with Patrick. Yeah, um, Julio Jones, which that didn't really work out, um, and Dominic and Sue. You know, these guys, are, they want to sign a one-year contract, right. kind of get paid, but they want to be on a contender. And, yeah, I do think they'll be a destination-type place for, for that kind of guy. Yeah, like Randy Moss in New England. Yeah. Um, uh, Briggsy, uh, Baby Briggs, wants to say uh, tight end in the third round or so. Yeah, you also have to start thinking about who's after a couple of these guys. Um, if Travis Kelsey's not going to play forever, and Patrick Mahomes is going to have to be the guy, you know, after Kelsey, after some of these guys. And you have a fairly young offensive line right now. Um, I think you have to lock up Orlando Brown. Um, I'm not imminently familiar with the Chiefs roster, but I don't think there's a ton after Orlando Brown that you have to go get back on this team. Yeah, I don't think Creed. I think Creed Humphrey is probably still a year or two away from yep. another deal. I'm sure they'll want him long term. Um, Trey Smith yeah. still still a, a couple years away. I think. I think they're both second year players. Yeah, but anyway, I, I I think overall they're in a good spot. You know, they might have some spots here and there that they need to shore up. But you said it. The foundation is there. You know, if Andy Reid retires, maybe that shakes things up but if he's there the front office is there Mahomes is there um they'd be the envy of a lot of franchises in the NFL if Andy Reid retires do you promote Eric Bieniemy a guy who can hardly get an interview anywhere else probably not for that reason like he's been he's been a big name for the last 3 or 4 cycles and um, either everybody's too dumb to hire him or there's a reason for there kind of being some hesitance there. Uh, thoughts on the halftime show? Didn't watch it. Really? Really. Not Just not a fan or? It doesn't move the needle for me. I, I really enjoyed a couple aspects of it. She just uh, went out and sang. There weren't a bunch of costume changes or anything. Um, I like the Super Smash Bros. setup. Uh, in the beginning, uh, yeah. we got a comment. Do not promote BNME. I, I don't think they. I don't think Andy Reid's going to retire. But if he does, that, that's going to be a conversation for sure. Um, but they they signed him to a one year deal. Uh, they they weren't even the, the Chiefs aren't even trying to lock him up long term. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the Colts are going to interview him. Uh, they're going to interview the the Eagles' offensive coordinator too. So I don't know. 
Uh, Andrew says the halftime show was great. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Can I say something on the halftime show as a, as a pillar of our society? Go ahead. There's too much discourse <laughs> around the halftime show every year. It's like a cycle before anybody can even say anything about the halftime show. There's uh-huh. like two or three types of people on Twitter. And this is all there is on the halftime show. Person number one is like, yeah, I don't even watch the halftime show. I don't even know who this person is. I don't care about the halftime show. It's like, okay, cool. Person number two is the person who, before anyone has a chance, like three seconds into the first song, is like, I don't know why all these boomers are out here hating on the halftime show. This is what music is today. And if you're offended, then you're an idiot. It's like nobody said they were offended. Literally nobody has even had a chance to say that they don't like the halftime show yet. Yeah. And then person number three is like, they stand way too hard and every halftime show ever is like always the greatest performance of all time. And no, person number one is not me, Big Ken. Don't put that in the comments. I just didn't watch it this year because I was doing stuff. And like I said, it wasn't appointment television for me. So anyway, those are the three types of people just like always satisfied with the halftime show, never satisfied with the halftime show, and way too eager to tell everybody that they were not offended by the hip hop and that anybody who is is a boomer, even though like nobody, I've never seen anybody actually offended at a halftime show. R&B. Save the, R&B. the Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson one. R&B. Wasn't hip hop. Um, Whatever. Over under 17 and a half Coors Lights for Patrick Mahomes tonight. <laughs> over. Yeah, the night is young in Phoenix. Oh, it's only eight thirty out there, right? And then in two days he'll pop up at some big concert like last time. <laughs> what was it? Uh, he was playing beer pong with um, uh, Post Malone. Like two days later, him and Travis Kelsey. <laughs> so good. Um, were you expecting the the Kelsey brothers dynamic after the game to be a little bit different than it was? First of all, just credit to me for muting myself so I didn't interrupt you. Good job, Rob. Um, what do you mean? I mean, in 2012, when the Harbaugh brothers went at it, the the pregame discussion was like, yeah, we can't even talk to each other. Like, this is going to be the hardest thing we've ever had to do. You know, I'm going to hate looking at the opposite sideline and seeing him. It was like, you could tell it was like intense and emotional for him. And I'm sure it was for the Kelsey brothers, but they like after the game. So the Harbaugh brothers after the game, it was like a real quick, probably like, Hey, I'll call you tomorrow type. Like, yeah, and just get on your way. Kelsey brothers kind of embraced it. Like didn't seem like it was that difficult on them emotionally compared to like what I thought it would be based on the Harbaugh brothers deal. And I don't know, maybe those two guys are just so laid back and. Well, they both already won one. Yeah. That was the first one for both of the Harbaugh brothers. Um, and you know, you probably didn't think you'd have an opportunity to go back, but I think both, both of them already have one. Both of them are hall of famers. Um, it's a team game. It's a tight end and a center, not two quarterbacks, not two head coaches. So, yeah. but I, 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 I respect a lot of the, what the Kelsey brothers did this week, because even, even late, uh, I heard an interview with Jason Kelsey, you know, they do the podcast together. And yep. they talked about it quite a bit on that, but even late he said, you know, this isn't the Kelsey Bowl. It's the Eagles and the Chiefs, and we're making it that way, and it's not about us. It's about the team, and I think they said a lot of the same, the right things. Um, I, I enjoy the dynamic. I, I, I like those two together, and I hope Travis Kelsey plays a long, long time, and I hope Jason Kelsey retires this year and goes into broadcasting. Yeah. I, I would prefer to not have to play against him anymore. You want to talk about Pat's legacy? Go um, down that rabbit hole? Yes. First, uh, Jacob says Cliff to Kansas City eyeball emoji, laughing emoji. Cliff to Houston. No, they hired somebody else. Oh, they did hire an offense coordinator? Yeah. Oh. So Can't maybe. Now. Maybe. Or maybe Cliff is still in Thailand. Um, you know, no, there's going to be back. some people who wonder about some greatest he's, of all time. What? He's back. Cliff's back. Back to what? He was in Houston. Yeah, he interviewed, but they didn't give him that job. So I know, but he's not in Thailand again. He might. How, how do you know? Because his girlfriend's in uh, his back in Poland or something. Okay, then wherever he's going. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be some greatest of all time discussions. 
Rahino Barbecue is the greatest of all time. Olton, Texas, at Rahino BBQ on social. Um, w- Rob, we, the great thing about being attached to Rahino is you get pictures in the DMs of like the line all through the Cardinals parking lot when Rahino's there. I know they sold out every day last week. So you got to get there early and you can order ahead, RahinoBBQ.com to make sure that your order is there and they've still got everything in stock when you show up. But yeah, you got to get there early. Whether you're going out to Olton or finding their mobile food truck somewhere in West Texas, you know them, you love them. Get there early, camp out if you have to, and then go enjoy the best barbecue in West Texas. Uh, two-time Super Bowl MVP, two-time MVP quarterbacks, Manning, Brady, Montana, Mahomes. Which Manning? Uh, Peyton won two MVPs. Eli was an MVP in both of those? Well, league MVPs. So quarterbacks with two league MVPs, oh. at least two Super Bowls, and a Super Bowl MVP, Manning, Brady, Montana, Mahomes. It's a good list to be on. Um, two Super Bowl winning quarterbacks, uh, Peyton... Eli uh, is is Patrick past those two? Um, Eli, yes. You mean like if he retired today, where would he stack up? Yeah, yeah, he'd be ahead of Eli, uh, behind Peyton, just because of the longevity. Um, but his trajectory, I think, is certainly outpacing. Peyton Manning was in, I think, year ten. Maybe year nine when he got his first. And then the second one was kind of like a, you know, forming a super group band in Denver. Uh, very tail end of his career. Defense carried him to that one. So, so yeah, he, he's trending ahead of Peyton for sure. But if he retired, he'd be ahead of Eli already. Um, We've got more quarterback names here. I don't, I don't know what this means. Uh, Roger Staubach did win two Super Bowls. Ahead of Roger? Yes. <laughs> what do you mean, yes? I mean, yes, but you just said that really quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm dismissive of... Hey, that guy spent time in the Navy, man. Respect to yeah, the Patriot. I, I respect the troops, but come on. like, Okay, let's do this. Go put on the Roger Staubach tape and find me two plays on there that you look at and go, yeah, Patrick Mahomes just isn't making that throw. Captain America? I, I, I bet you could find some Staubach throws. I, Not I better than gave, Mahomes. But. I just gave you the homework assignment. Somebody send me the two throws from Roger Staubach's tape that Patrick Mahomes just, it's off the table. He can't make that play. Go Rod, for it. Roger played against Plumbers. I think you could do that with uh, Brady, but that didn't just straight up mean that Mahomes is better than Brady. You could say that about Brady, for sure. I have said that about Brady. Yeah. The Navy is overrated from the airman in the uh, chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People are saying. Uh, what about Kurt Warner? Just one Super Bowl championship, but also a quick, yeah. quick career. Um, I think you could argue that he's already better than uh, Brett Favre. Brett Favre just won one. And obviously yeah. longevity and lots of yards. Um, I think you've passed Drew Brees. Brees kind of a, a stat. Ho but not yeah. really a, a winner. That's the way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, so let's do it this way. Which quarterbacks are still ahead of Mahomes? Brady. Um, Montana. My goat. Um, Joe Montana's your goat? Yeah. Okay. Four Super Bowls. Um, Aikman? Three. Three Super Bowls? Four? He won four. Aikman? Um... Aikman S3, um, I would argue that Aikman, you know, did a lot on those teams. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a lot of weapons, uh, but so has Patrick. Patrick has had a lot of weapons, too. Defensively, probably the Cowboys better than the Chiefs. Um, I, I would still put Aikman ahead just because he has three, but obviously lots of career left, and I would not, I would not have Aikman much longer on there uh, in front of him. Bradshaw? 
I mean, Bradshaw four. had four, and it took him a whole decade to do it, but he got four. Um, I think that's a close one. With historically good defenses, by yes. the way. Yes. Yeah, and it, it wasn't like those offenses were doing a lot. And you had put some respect on Lynn Swan. You had some fluke plays, right, (laughs) to get those done. Obviously, um, some big plays in the Chiefs' two Super Bowls too. I did Bradshaw lose one? I I think four and zero. Yeah, Montana four and zero too. Um, here here's a couple, a little more modern. Aaron Rodgers only has the one. Is he ahead of Rodgers? I think so. Yeah. Um. Here's one. This is the one I think is maybe the best comp. Ben Roethlisberger. I I think, I think he's right there with Ben Roethlisberger. But That's I would probably I edge would, him. If he retired today, I'd put him behind Bradshaw, Montana, Brady, and I would put him like right there with Roethlisberger, and and maybe another guy you could kind of put in that same realm. He's like in that tier. I'm I'm close on Bradshaw. <laughs> Steve Young? No. Steve Young just won one. Oh, did he really? Uh-huh. I thought he had multiple. Nope. Monta- they've won all... five, and Montana won four, yeah. Okay, those are, yeah, they were all Montanas. Because Young got beat by the Cowboys twice, then beat the Cowboys, and then uh, lost to the Packers, I think. Okay. Dan Marino? Yeah, yeah I think he's past Dan Marino. Dan Marino never won a Super Bowl. Zero. Yeah, I think he's ahead of everybody who isn't a multi-Super Bowl champ. He's probably ahead of anybody who's ever won two. I mean, you can say GTFO with Bradshaw, but 4-0 and in the yeah. Super Bowl is 4-0. I mean, and, and I think Star, you know, Bart Starr uh, didn't win a bunch of Super Bowls, but he had like seven NFL championships or whatever yeah. before. So I think he's I, – I think you have to give him some respect too. But again, what, top ten? Five years into the league as a starter? Yeah. I mean, that's easily yeah. top 10. Here's what I'm watching for is the ultimate guy that he'll be compared to at the end of his career is Tom Brady. And Brady had two separate dynasties that were like a decade apart. So he won three like right out of the gates and then went dormant for a decade, right? Because he didn't win another one until 2015, a 2014 season. Super Bowl of 2015 when they beat the Seahawks in a game that they shouldn't have won. So he had three, and then he, he was stuck at three for the first 15 years of his career. And then he stacked a bunch at the very end when he was old. And so if Mahomes can get one more, he sort of buys himself a lot of time before like he would lose pace with Brady. Yeah. Because um, Brady did not get ring number four until way later in his career. And that would be hard for Mahomes to duplicate, say like, okay, well, he's going to get another three rings when he's 37 or older. Like, he's probably not. However, um, if like, let's say he won another one in the next two or three years and then went like six years without one, he wouldn't really be behind Brady at that same point in their careers. So that's kind of what I'm watching for is he really only needs one in the next, let's call it eight years um, to stay on Brady's pace. And that would take a, an amazing final five years of his career if he is on that trajectory, but he's not, I think people forget that about Brady that he quote unquote only had three until he was like 35, which three is like insane for anybody anyway. Um, But it wasn't like he stacked them all when he was young or like won them very consistently every few years, there was three bunched up together and then a long break. And then all the ones he won, on the tail end of his career. So Brady won in 2002, 2004, 2005. Okay, I was thinking the last one was four. And then 15, 17, 19, and then 21. Yeah, so there was a decade in between his third and fourth. And he went to two in the in the doldrums and went 19-0 and 0 one year uh, before he lost to Manning, so... 18-0. and 0. <clears throat> Well, 19-1. Eighteen and one. Was he eighteen and one? Whatever yes. it was, whatever it was, he was undefeated in the regular season. Yeah, the dude couldn't get past Eli Manning. Yeah. in the prime of his career. Yeah. So, I and, and I don't think look, I'll clarify this too. I don't think Mahomes needs to match Brady in Super Bowl titles to have an honest conversation. Just like 
Um, okay, people want to argue MJ and LeBron. Neither one of them has as many rings as Bill Russell, and Bill Russell's not in anybody's GOAT conversation. And so I think you do need to win championships to have your legacy debated at a certain level. But I, I think the number for Mahomes is four. If he can get to four, you can make a credible argument. If he gets five, I think it leans Mahomes' way. If he gets six, I think there's like very little discussion. Yeah, and if, if he doesn't play for 20, 21, 22 years? Right. I mean, if he wins five and 15 instead of seven and 22, I mean, I think you're having that conversation anyways. And look, again, Mahomes is a better quarterback than Tom Brady. Yes. Just physically gifted, makes bigger throws and, and whatever else. Now, the mental aspect, the preparation, the determination, Tom Brady does a lot of that. Yeah, all the narratives that we've invented about Tom Brady. Those are all true. The intangibles. Yes, those are all true. Yeah. Kyle. Um, <laughs> but, but Patrick also does those. The intangibles of being dragged to the Super Bowl by Teddy Bruschi. Yeah, and Richard Sherman. Uh, not Richard Sherman. Richard Rod- Seymour. Rodney Seymour. Oh, Richard Seymour. Rodney Harrison, but he Rodney was a, Harrison. he was a bum. Must be uh, nice to play on like the league's best defense for two decades in your career. What about uh, Zach Thomas's legacy? Yes, finally. Well, I say finally. He didn't wait that long comparatively, but I thought he, he I thought he should have been first ballot. I mean, I'm sure people have seen this side by side of him versus Erlacher. Zach Thomas wins almost every single statistical category. Just doesn't have the same fanfare for whatever reason. Didn't win a and Erl- Erlacher was a slam dunk automatic, and Zach Thomas had to sort of wait this out. Very deserving, and I think it's cool to see a middle linebacker from Texas Tech because our perception outside of the little bubble here is like, oh, all they do is air it out, and it's offensive-minded. And so to have a, a guy from Pampa, Texas, who played middle linebacker for Spike Dykes make it to the Hall of Fame, I think is awesome. In the same offseason that you're about to have a top 10 pick at defensive end mm-hmm. and a linebacker who – Granted, towards ACL, but should have been in a lot of conversations at the end of the year. If the Seahawks were a little bit better, um, it, it's 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 good to see, and it's good to see that success in the NFL, and it's good to see a a coach who can take advantage, right? Yeah, <laughs> at Texas Tech, New Mexico what bias. Did you think, say. What did you think of the video of Zach Thomas finding out? So good, so good, and and you you kind of. I, 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 it was a little cheap. He didn't get the knock on the door, right? Because he had to wait. The guy retired. Uh, the the large human being that used to knock on everybody's door. Uh, but to have Jimmy there, who was his coach in Miami, and and to see Jimmy talk and and have him come up the stairs and everybody, his whole family's there. That was really special. And it's you know, when you see a grown man like that break down in tears, you, you get a little West Texas in your eye. Yeah, that's what I was. It, it didn't really send me over the edge until Jimmy Johnson's voice cracked and like he couldn't really hold it together when he was congratulating Zach Thomas. Cause you know, that that's a, a special bond coach and player. And so for them to both be, I don't know, what is it now? 25 years or not uh, 15 or 20 years removed from, you know, when they were coaching and playing together. Um, and, and Jimmy Johnson is a guy who's coached a bunch of Hall of Famers. You know, it's not like Zach Thomas was, you know, the crown jewel of, of players he coached. Like, he was with all sorts of dudes that are in the Hall of Fame. And so for that moment to still be equally special for Jimmy Johnson, even though he's seen a bunch of his guys get that same phone call, I thought that was the best part of the video. Can you name the second team that Zach Thomas played for in his NFL career? Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. I remember this was one of my coming-of-age as a football fan moments when, like, before you follow – the NFL draft that closely and like have all these guys colleges memorized, um, you know, growing up in Austin, especially the, the big red Raider in my life was my youth pastor. And uh, he was like, Hey, you know, the Cowboys linebacker Zach Thomas. I was like, yeah. And he was like, he played at Texas tech. I was like, Oh really? I didn't know that. You know? So I remember like being a kid and finding yeah. out that he was a red Raider. And then of course, as I've grown older and sort of grown in appreciation for the history of, 
the game itself and Texas Tech specifically, um, kind of like learning how how much Zach Thomas meant to the Texas Tech program, and of course now putting his NFL career into perspective and it being honored in the way that it deserves is is really cool. Um, Oregon, Oregon game, Ring of Honor, Zach Thomas. Oh, he's already in the Ring of Honor. Is he? He's in the Hall of Fame. Is he in the Ring of Honor? Yeah, he was in oh, the okay. initial class with Gabe Rivera, Donnie Anderson, and Dave Parks. Okay. Good. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. That's yeah. yeah that's right. That's right. Well, you got to have some kind of ceremony. Bring him back. I think I don't want to jump ahead here, but I think in the Discord mailbag, somebody asked us, um, sponsored by Diversified Lenders, by the way, diversifiedlenders.com, turn your accounts receivable into cash. I think somebody asked who's next into the Texas Tech Ring of Honor. What say you? Do you think that they should do one every year? No. Okay. Me neither. Um, Graham Harrell, though, makes sense next, right? I know you want me to say Wes Welker. I, I want to say Wes Welker. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, would you do Wes this year? No, I, I'd be okay entering sort of a cooling off period because I don't want it to it, – it should be special. I don't want Wes Welker or Graham Harrell or Tracy Saul or whoever to be like, oh, well, like, like yeah, you're, you're this year's inductee and – we did eight guys the eight years prior to, to announcing you, and it, you know, it's okay to wait three years. You know, Wes Welker's not going anywhere. Um, Graham Harrell's not going anywhere. So you can wait until they're. I'm, I guess we're not waiting until guys' careers are finished because we did Mahomes uh, when he was in his twenties. Right. <laughs> so I was gonna say, like, if you want to wait till well, well, till Wes Welker's done coaching or Graham Harrell's done coaching, but uh, clearly that doesn't matter. So. I think I think Wes and Graham are the two that deserve it for their on the field accolades. Was Wes uh, all American? He might have been as a punt returner. And then uh, Graham, obviously, somebody says Amendola. No, probably not. He had a lot of NFL success, and and I think you have a space for him in the Hall of Fame. Um, but I would keep the Ring of Honor small. What about Torian Henderson? Was he a All American? I don't know, but he was an NCAA record holder. Yeah, school yeah. record holder by a wide margin. the The chat is saying a couple of coaches here: Spike and um, Mike Leach. Do you, Do you think there should be a separate honoring for those guys? I, yeah, I don't Hall know. of Famers, I, obviously. Do you, Do you want players in the Ring of Honor? Or do you want players and coaches? Joey McGuire. I, I think that's a, so I was thinking players only and yeah, I don't know how I feel about coaches. I'm not, I guess I'm not against it. I just haven't given it much thought. Um, I would go players only, but, I, but I, th- I would be absolutely okay with a, a moment of silence or whatever else for Mike Leach at some game this year. Well, I liked your idea of, and on the south end zone renovation, you know, making like a Mike Leach walk of fame. And, you know, maybe you have a ring of honor type thing for coaches. And I think a conversation to be had at some point is Cliff Kingsbury. More for his playing career, but also just recognizing that he was head coach here as well. Um, and then you were so good in the 70s. How about a guy like Rodney Allison or just – Another player too that was sort of a staple in that era. You had a, a Peach Bowl appearance. I can't remember if you won that game or not, but that uh, 1976 team was co Southwest Conference champions. I think you were good in 73, 74, 76. And so it's got to be some guys that merit some consideration from those types of teams. Absolutely. Um, Oh, how am I blanking on his name? James had not. I think you could have a discussion about him. Yeah, again, it, there there is some criteria that's already been written, and I think that Texas Tech did such a poor job beyond when Rodney Allison came back to be in charge of everything uh, at honoring the past. I think they do have some catching up to do, but I I think they're pretty well caught up right now. 
Uh, Wes, Graham, I think both deserve it. And they can be in, in the next five years. And then if you want to find a guy like Tracy Saul, who's the only and the last four-time All-Southwest Conference player, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you want to honor a few more, I, I'm down with that. I don't want to keep guys out. And I'm not the kind of person that says, uh, well, you cheap in the ring if a bunch of guys are in it. <clears throat> you want to say that you had some historic success, right? Um, yep. If you don't have guys to put in, you don't have guys that were good. And Texas Tech has a lot of good players in their history. So yep. I'm not opposed to anyone. Um, and I don't, I'm not necessarily opposed to doing one every year, but if you're going to have a ring of honor, um, it's gotta be, it's gotta be really special that, that they did something here and, or beyond, which is like what Patrick did. Byron Hansford. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just rattling guys off that I think you could have a, a pretty serious conversation about. Yeah. I think Torian Henderson is a good one. I think Tracy saw, I think Wes Welker, I think Rodney Allison. Um, and again, if you want to broaden out that Hall of Fame and get a physical Hall of Fame at the stadium in those renovations, which is what you mentioned, uh, I, I, I meant earlier with the Mike Leach thing. Yeah, I do it. H have all the history there. Yeah, put some busts uh, down in the south end zone and and have a walkway and a breezeway where where people can go learn about some of these great players you've had in your history. Yeah, I'm with you, Devin Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> uh, Bam Morris, yeah, Super Bowl champion. Uh, with with Patrick Mahomes winning the Super Bowl, you also add uh, another ring to the collection. There for a while, it was like eleven, uh, fourteen or fifteen straight Super Bowls that had a, a red Raider in it, and then I think you missed last year, but you start a new streak this year. Real quick. This should not be overshadowed. Uh, shout out to Zach McPherson on the losing side in this one, unfortunately for him. But a guy who uh, – he was pretty vocal on Twitter about kind of being shown the door at Penn State. And at that juncture, his collegiate career was about halfway over, and they basically said, like, hey, you're not going to cut it here. You're not going to get playing time. And he starts over far from home at what I'm sure seemed to him like a random school. And when he came in, I remember like, you know, okay, I guess we'll see what this guy has. And he was just a really, really good football player for you at Texas Tech. And unfortunately was um, not on some great teams as far as piling up wins. Uh, but I remember him declaring for the draft. I think he had a COVID year. And I was a little bit surprised that he declared for the draft just because I wasn't yeah. thinking of him as that type of prospect. And then he goes fairly early, like third or fourth round, I believe, which fourth, is early I enough think, that yeah. you're, you're – you're going to make the roster and, um, you know, had some good plays this year. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to get at a few years ago when he was basically forced to transfer to Texas tech from Penn state. He was probably not in his wildest dreams thinking I'm going to be playing in the super bowl. And so he had a great season with the Eagles and I think that's a good spot for him to be in. And, you know, of course we wish him the best of luck going forward. Yeah. And he's been great on special teams um, he'll, he'll be in a position to sign a second contract in the NFL. He'll probably be able to stay for a long time, um, get some opportunities on the field, uh, probably at the nickel or a, a low safety position. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good for him. Um, it's now baseball season. Um, any, any broad thoughts on the baseball uh, team coming up? I know we have a preview... This week, I believe, with uh, Dinger Derby, Keith Patrick, friend of the program, a, a podcast that we mention, you know, all the time on this show. All the time. Um, so maybe we save a lot of that for him. Uh, I believe he has a new co-host. I don't know if he's he's mentioned that yet, so we won't spoil it here, but maybe we can get both those guys on this week. Yeah. That'd be nice. New co-host was trying to chirp me, even though I was being really nice to a player from his alma mater on Twitter. Yeah. And uh, I thought about taking the low road as I've done from time to time on Twitter, but I, I thought better of it. Uh, 
Ryan wants me to break down the Rangers rotation. I will say, um, me and Kyle, Kyle doesn't know this. We're going to do a Rangers twins, uh, season, season bet this year. Hey, I might just be a Rangers fan from now on. Okay. Like I live here. The ballpark is right down the road. Dude, you got to get a, a 20 pack. Josh Young is there. Yeah. Why would I root for the twins? I mean, I, I still love the twins. I hate the twins. But I'm here now. Uh, if, if Josh Young is going to be hitting dingers for the next 15 years in Arlington, then how can I pass that up? It's all right. I do also want to apologize here. Um, it, we are still in basketball season. That's right. We need to uh, focus. A uh, big one coming up. Uh, so you hate the students camping out for the Texas game? Is that is that what I saw? <laughs> I don't think I said that. <laughs> Am I obfuscating you? I think I said that I would not. I would probably go make different arrangements for watching the Super Bowl than maybe trying to stream it on a phone or laptop in a tent. People are free to do whatever they want. I don't understand uh, the decision to camp out, but teach their own. I wouldn't be camping out for this game. Uh, you got to get the boomstick. I I need a. Uh, I need a content Kyle. Uh, boomstick eating video at the at the ballpark. It's a three foot hot dog with chili and jalapenos and the fixings. You ever had a boomstick? No. What's the biggest hot dog you ever took down? Probably uh oh this is gross. Um, you ever been like so hungry that you're eating so fast that your brain hasn't caught up and you don't feel full even though you've eaten a ton of so you just keep eating. Um, I had a chili cheese footlong coney at Sonic and like did not put a dent in my hunger. I was like, I, like, I don't feel a thing. And so I ordered another one. So I had two footlongs in one sitting, but so I don't know if that counts as 24 or if that counts as, yeah. cause you know, doing some quick math here, 12 times two. Anyway. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's girthy too. Um, and it's a pretzel bun, according to Big Hen. I don't, I don't know that was, uh, you know, I had it back when Nelson Cruz, the originator of the boomstick, was there. So it's been, you know, a decade since I've had a boomstick. Anyways, uh, just scored mailbag? Uh, yeah, then, uh, do you want to talk some conference realignment? Yeah, you want to do that first? Sure. Um, is it me or does it feel like some stuff is about to go down? So if, going way back, you and I were like, wouldn't it be great if you just hit the magic reset button and 2024 is when everything changes. The college football playoff expands. USC and UCLA go to the Big Ten. Texas and OU go to the SEC. And check, check, check. So I don't know if the Pac-12 is going to expand. I don't know if they're going to stand pat at 10. I don't know if some of them are going to get jumpy and come to the Big 12. But if they do, that would be in 2024 because their current TV deal is up in summer of 2024. So if they want to be on TV in the fall of 2024, they've got to either sign a new deal, which they can't get anybody to bid on, apparently. That's what all the reports are indicating. Or they need to come join the Big 12 and be added pro rata on the Fox and ESPN deal that we're on. So this, the Texas and OU leaving, I think is a big deal. I think it I think it opens the door for Big Twelve expansion a little more imminently than I I thought you were gonna have to kinda like wait them out through one more crappy T V deal and then they would jump when the Delta and money was just too much for the Utahs and Colorados to pass up. But now I'm wondering if they're it, it only takes one domino to fall. And so I'm I guess I'm more curious than I was a couple weeks ago before all this started going down. Yeah, it, when the playoff expands, there's no reason for the Big 12 to expand. Um, unless it, unless it's Oregon, right? Because I think that would lead to a, an influx in money eventually. Unless it kills the Pac-12, which I think would lead to an influx in money, your next TV deal, which obviously I think the Four Corners does that. Um, 
But in the expanded playoff, would you rather, you know, get through eleven other schools or f- or fifteen other schools to get to the to the playoff? You know what I mean. I get what you're saying, but in a 12 team playoff, if you have a strong conference, you can get three teams in. Right, so, right. So you and- don't have to win your league. And I also think that this has been underrated at every step of the way the last 15 years in conference realignment discussions is stability. And right. everybody takes their stability for granted. The Big 12 told themselves, we don't need to add BYU and Cincinnati a decade ago. Well, yeah, you do. You should have elevated them a decade ago for when Texas and OU stab you in the back. And everybody in the Pac-12 said, oh, we don't need to expand. We don't need to add Oklahoma State and Kansas. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, wouldn't you be falling all over yourselves for Kansas and Oklahoma State now instead of SMU? And so I would – I think it would be an example of this conference not learning the same lesson that other conferences have learned repeatedly – which is that expansion gives you stability. And if you go to 16 with the four corners or 18 with Oregon and Washington, you are far less poachable and unstable in this. If everybody's fearing that it's going to go to a power two or whatever, the way you survive is strength in numbers, in my opinion. And if the big 12 just stands pat, then yeah, the next time one of these conferences makes a move, they pluck two, and now you're unstable because you've only got eight or ten or whatever. When you could have, like, okay, like let's say you go to eighteen with Oregon, Washington, and the four corners. Everyone's like, well, what if Oregon and Washington go to the Big Ten? Okay, let them. You still have a conference of sixteen. You're totally stable. You're still in the power three, power four, whatever it is by that point, and you just move on with your life. The struggle is if you stay at twelve, and then three or four leave. Now you're screwed again, and you have to at Fresno or UNLV or something. And so I think that's why you do it, is for stability and security long-term. Right. I, I don't necessarily think it makes the Big 12 better immediately to add the four-corner schools, but it it kills the Pac-12. And the Pac-12 would then you know, backfill with SMU and um, UNLV and San Diego State and all these Colorado State and all these schools they're talking to if you could just get Oregon, Washington, and the Arizona schools and leave Colorado and Utah in the dust, those four would effectively murder the Pac-12, and the Power Four would obviously be the ACC, the Big 12, and then the Big Two. I just think if you, if you stay where you are, let's fast forward six years and say Oregon and Washington go Big Ten – Maybe the SEC wants two more, and who knows who they want by that point. Maybe it's Kansas. Maybe it's Baylor. I mean, I I don't know. Maybe West Virginia goes to the ACC. I don't feel like you're leaving yourself in a strong position by staying at 12. And, like, okay, let's play this game. Let's fast forward to 2031 or 2036, whenever the ACC grant of rights is up. Say the Big Ten takes two and the SEC takes two. Are you in a strong enough position to poach them? Or if you stay where you are, could the ACC call West Virginia, Cincinnati, Kansas? And then, like, again, you're just back to square one. You're going, oh, well, crap, now our conference is being rated by the ACC. I wish we had Utah and Colorado and the Arizonas on board. Because then you could poach Louisville and NC State, Virginia Tech, whoever. So I, I – I think there's strength in numbers and expanding, and it makes you far more stable and secure going forward. And I think it's worth it even if even if they don't add a little money, if it's totally even and it makes your path to the playoff harder, I think it's a gamble you take. Well, and it it it's a net neutral, right? Because the the money per school is the same, but the conference payout gets bigger. Um and again, if you have a really strong conference and Oregon, Kansas State, and Texas Tech all make the playoff one year, you get more money because you have three playoff teams. Can we all unite around and agree at just laughing at the Pac-12, really just botching everything for the last 15 years? Well, let's just do it from July 26th. 
it, that too. But I, I was willing to go back further to when they could have had the first 16 team super conference. And you can blame Texas for that, but also I feel like the PAC 10 at the time could have made a deal. Um, two summers ago when Texas and OU said they were leaving the morons who were not USC and UCLA somehow didn't see that USC and UCLA were going to do the exact same thing that Texas and OU did. They could have probably signed a new TV deal and added teams. It would have made yeah. them more stable. They've always turned their nose up at BYU, which is like a, a national brand. They've got the facilities. They have the athletic programs and they just didn't want them. They could have had each of the last two um, men's basketball national champions, Baylor and Kansas, at any at any point before like a year ago. And they turned their nose up at it. They could have had Texas Tech, Oklahoma State, and now they're courting San Diego State and SMU. And they could have had any of their pick of better programs than that. They bring more eyeballs, more money, more credibility. And they just said, no, 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 no. And now they're stuck. They have to add. San Diego State and SMU. And I thought this was going to be... I thought everything was done, you know, through 2025 uh, because Texas and Oklahoma were not going to be able to leave. Now that they can leave, I really do think that, that you know, we were onto something early where you kind of get a reset at 2024 because you're going to have the Big Ten done, you're going to have the SEC done, and if you could do one fail swoop and get a couple of schools in, even if it's just two, even if it's just the Arizona schools, even if you just crack the armor, um, yeah, it's got I, it's going to be good. I think we're at an interesting juncture. Um, a couple of things that might come together. One, the Big Twelve now has buyout money from Texas and OU, and I've seen it speculated that they could use that to entice some Pac-12 schools. Um. The Pac-12, all the reporting is that their suitors are not as interested as they thought. And George Klyakov kind of prom- over-promised, under-delivered to this point. And every day that goes by without a deal, their bargaining position, their leverage decreases. And it looks worse and worse for the conference. Because if you're one of these providers at this point, you're like, you know, what else are you going to do? Right. We're not going to bid on you. you know, take it or leave it. Um, their best case scenario probably is going streaming heavy and losing a lot of visibility. And that's only if a streamer wants to overpay, which at this juncture, why would you? Again, you have no competition. And so the decision by your mark to jump ahead in line, so to speak, looks wiser by the day. And I don't know. I, I think the Big 12 managed this a lot better. I think the Pac-12, the other thing that they had going for them was the fourth window, and that's the like 10 p.m. Eastern and later. Uh, they're the only conference that can deliver that time slot. The network's like that because there's no competition, so it commands more eyeballs than it otherwise would. But if I'm ESPN and I'm about to go in on a Pac-12 deal with Amazon uh, so, I, so I can show the fourth window – Why would I pay 10 schools or 12 if they had San Diego State and SMU when I could sort of handpick and say, hey, we'll pay you four or six to go to the Big 12. We get our fourth window inventory. That's all we want anyway. We don't really care about the Pac-12 in the afternoon. And so I wonder, I hope your mark is greasing the skids at ESPN saying, put the Big 12 in the fourth window. Like, help me get four or six of these Mountain and Pacific time zone teams And the Big 12 will play from noon Eastern all the way through, you know, midnight Eastern when the last game ends. Well, that's what we thought when the new contract was uh, discussed when it said any school you add, the the money will grow, you know, they'll slot in and have the same amount of money as everyone else. Uh, That was the thought that, okay, well, then you're just promising Arizona and Arizona State the pie's not going to change. This is what you get. And it right. kind of broadcasts, hey, here's here's your payout if you join. Right. So I don't know. I think that's an interesting development. I'm sure your mark is working that because he's proven himself kind of a competent forward thinker um, at every turn to this juncture. And so I think he sees the opportunity there. And if he can get enough mountain time zone and Pacific time zone inventory for the Big 12, I don't know why ESPN would pay 
10 or 12 teams in the Pac-12 when they could just pay four or six at a prorated amount in the Big 12. It would be cheaper for the network. You know, it would be hopefully more money for those four corner schools to play in the Big 12 than in the Pac-12. So I, I hope that that's enough of a win-win all around that it, it makes sense for all sides. Agreed. And I still think we've got some ACC chat um, questions. I The ACC is not going to make any moves in, until they are done. Uh, they can't. Or, and if they do, the conference will get blown up. Yeah. And why would ESPN especially want Clemson in the SEC when they could pay Clemson ACC money for the next 10 years? Exactly. Because I think it's through 36. I think so. So I thir- like 12 more years, yeah. 13, whatever it is. I can't do math. Okay, that's all I had for now on conference realignment, and I'm I'm just glad to see Texas know you go early. I wish it was I wish it was this season. But Same. I'll take it. Same. Uh, all right. Do you want to do another uh, Discord mailbag read so I can scroll back here? Yes, Discord mailbag sponsored by our friends at Diversified Lenders. Help your business get the cash it needs now. Diversifiedlenders.com. Red Raider owned and operated. Did that give you enough time? Yeah, I'm going to go back. It's been a while since we've been in the mailbag, so I'm back a little bit. Um, Thoughts on a conference challenge in football like in basketball, and who or what are some of the matchups you'd like to see in a Big Ten, Big 12 conference challenge? What was the first part of this question? Uh, Thoughts on a basically a conference football challenge like they do in basketball, like a Big Ten, Big 12 football weekend. Yeah, I'm for it. I would love to. I think I've been on record before. uh, I would love to play two Power Five teams in the non-con, one home, one away. So you could even align yourself with two different conferences and do a Big 12 ACC challenge and a Big 12 SEC challenge or or whatever. And even if it's not, if you have 16 teams and the Big Ten has 16 teams, you could just hold on the schedule, hey, road Big Ten, home Big Ten, and you could go back and forth with a Big Ten school, and whatever it is, whatever the standing is the year before, that's who you're playing the next year. It, just do some NFL scheduling. And you could have it 10 years out. You could sign up for 10 years, and you don't know who you're playing until you know the end of the regular season, and then it sets up for next year, and you have a, a full year to, to look up who you're playing next year. Yeah. I love it. Um. Start bench cut these broken lizard movies. Uh, do you know who Broken Lizard is? No. Uh, Beer Fest, Super Troopers, Club Dread. I don't think I know what any of those things are. I would start Super Troopers and bench Beer Fest. I remember uh, that, my first beer. Are those movies? Yeah. Broken okay. Lizard is a production company. Okay. Get a large Farva. I don't want a large Farva. Start bench cut the most punchable faces in Big 12's men, men's basketball. Brock Cunningham, Grady Dick, Caleb Grill. Uh, Grills is the least punchable. So I guess cut. Uh, then I'll start Cunningham. Yeah, I would start Cunningham. Bench Dick. Uh, can Kyle name the 16 Big East basketball schools from between 2007 and 2012? 2007. Hold on. When did the ACC expand? Um, all right. So I'll name the current ones first. Let's go Creighton, Xavier, Marquette, St. John's, uh, Providence. That's five. Seton Hall. Big East, Big East, Villanova. Yep. Does UConn play in the Big East? Yes, or the basketball. American? Okay. That's eight. Da, da, da. Is St. Louis? Nope. In the Big East? No. Okay. Um, I 
I'll tap out because I know the people hate this content. No, they love it. That's why they keep asking for it. Uh, did you say Xavier? Yeah. Did you say DePaul? No. Butler? Oh, duh. You played DePaul. I should have guessed that one. Butler, yeah, UConn, Creighton, DePaul, Georgetown, Marquette, Providence, St. Yeah, John's, the, Seton Hall. Those are the two I was missing from the current 10-team league. And as far as past ones, I guess, again, I don't remember when the ACC expanded, so I guess it would have been like Pitt, uh, West Virginia, Rutgers, uh, Syracuse. Because the question was from 2007 to current? To 2012. Um, oh, I thought you said 2007. It was 7 to 12 was the question. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know. But I That's, don't have that on my thing either. Yeah. Uh, Florida, like Florida women's lacrosse was in the, the Big East for a while. The more you know. Start bench cut the NFL honors. Pat's MVP, Zach Thomas Hall of Fame, Dax Man of the Year. Start Zach Thomas, bench Pat Mahomes, cut Dak Prescott. Yeah, I would too. That's tough. I mean, one is for a career, one is for a season, and one is for not even the game of football. Uh, da, 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 da. Did you see Oklahoma State's uh, ride for the brand graphic? Yes. They're, are they trolling us at this point? They have to be. Isn't that crazy? Uh, let's see. We already discussed this one. Start bench cut. Red chili, green chili, Christmas style. Oh, uh, cut Christmas style. Oh, I would start Christmas style. No, I'll start red, bench green, cut Christmas. I would bench green. Um, Let's see. Start, bench, cut, Super Bowl party edition. Large crowd, small group, solo. Um, I think it depends on the extent to which I care about the outcome of the game. If I don't like last year, Rams Bengals totally like could not even make myself pick a side. I would want a large crowd for the social aspect. If it's Vikings Chiefs, I probably I cannot watch that with anybody else. And then the mid sized crowd for a game that I care about somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. I would go start small group. Bench solo. Uh, went to a few huge Super Bowl parties. Not for me. Uh, who is the most likable sports superstar, Mahomes or Nowitzki? There's too many people with halftime show opinions at a large Super yeah. Bowl party. When like nobody's watching the game, you can't focus, and then everyone comes in for the halftime show, and it's like, okay, what are we doing here? Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, redo this question. Uh, most likable sports superstar, Mahomes or Nowitzki? Um, for me, Mahomes, for the general public, probably Nowitzki. I think, unfortunately for Pat, he turned the corner tonight, uh, to being actively rooted against by the general public. Like they're reaching the point where they're winning too much. And so, Next year when they play whoever in the Super Bowl, they're just going to root for the opposite teams. They're like, yeah, I'm tired of Mahomes and the Chiefs winning all the time. So that's unfortunate. Just like Brady had haters and like people yeah. root for anybody but the Patriots to win the Super Bowl. Uh, did you see Oklahoma State's tweet about the field? They were bragging that they developed the grass. Yeah, brutal. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. This is grass has been around for a while, but this was the first time they used it in an NFL game. I don't know. It's pretty. I mean, it's pretty wild to have a, a fairly new strain of grass, especially in a place like Arizona where you're having to roll it out into the sunlight and then roll it back into the stadium, which is something we don't talk about nearly enough. That is incredible. Science, man. Engineering. Yeah. Architecture. It's not really architecture. Yeah, it is. The architecture of building a stadium to roll a 100-yard field out and in in back in? L landscape architecture. Engineering. what Whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. 
Um, I thought we were talking grass science specifically. No, the actual, the actual, you know, mechanism to roll the entire field out as one piece under the building. Getting to know the gauchos, the only C I ever got in college was in horticulture. And I got a C because I had a 79 after sleeping through the final exam. And the professor wouldn't let me. I was like, can I retake it? Like not for full credit, not for half credit to get like a a 20 on the final exam just to raise my full grade for the semester up by like one point. And she said no, which is her right. I shouldn't have overslept. But that's the only C I got in college. Over under me getting more C's in college than you. Mm, I don't know how good of a student you were. I was not a great student. I had more than one C. Uh, resident Arizona fan says, no, Rob, it's dumb. Just put turf down. Yeah. It is pretty dumb. Uh, but the Arizona Cardinals, uh, poverty program, but they can just... Uh, Go poverty out franchise. Go I get and, misquoted there a lot. I yeah, didn't say poverty program. Go out and put billions of dollars into grass technology to roll it out. Poverty franchise. Uh, nothing's wrong with getting C's. C's get degrees. D's get degrees too. I One time uh, on a test, the professor, this is the kind of student I was. Uh, the professor wrote a paragraph to me on a test. He said, hey, you know, this was really good. If you applied yourself, you could be something. <laughs> So yeah, that was the kind of student I was. Yeah. Um, I also got a B one time because of attendance. You've you've frozen. Are we gonna get all the way? Oh no. Kyle, okay, now you're back. Yep. You froze for a second. I, was my face as bad as your face was? I don't know. Well, you, I don't know my face, and you don't know your face. So that was a dumb question. Uh, final thoughts. I got to be in a uh, walking class because I didn't show up enough. What's better than one D? Uh, hey, did you, um, what was the first B you got like in your life? Do you remember? Um, no. I was Not in really. junior high. I was typing. <laughs> typing. Yeah, that was my first B in junior high. First of all, I, I never failed a class. Are we talking high school still? A- anything. Me neither. I don't think I got a C on anything in uh, through high school. Like C was that C I got in college was the only C I ever got in anything. Yeah, I don't think I ever school, finished with a C school. in high school. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know my uh, GPA though. It was not. It was not uh, yeah. Sterling. I'd have to look mine up too. I don't remember. Anyways, you're here for a good time and a long time. I was at college for a long time, but I also had a really good time. So, Yeah. Even at LCU. Chap them. Pe- peck them. All right, final thoughts. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm glad I waited it out because I probably would have started talking around the time you said I'm tired. So trying out that new technique actually paid off. You're Um, learning. No final thoughts. I'm just really happy for Patrick Mahomes and excited to see what happens next with Big 12 Conference Realignment. You want to make a a pick real quick on the Texas game? Yeah, do we have a line? Look at like Ken Palm or Haslam or BPI or something to get a a projected line. I, I would... Where would you set the line before looking at some of those? Uh, Texas minus one. Hmm. I would probably, I think you do get a lot of credit for home court, but I would still, I would say Texas minus four and a half. Four. It's, it opened a, at three and a half. Who's that uh, according to? Bovada has it at a flat four right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hate to say it, but give me Texas. Minus four. Yeah. You uh, two in a row in a row at home. Yeah. Iowa State and uh, Kansas State. 
Texas is just a – they're a pretty complete team. They – I think Rodney Terry is doing a good job there on a, on an interim for now basis. But I think he's probably doing a good enough job to warrant a pretty serious look. You are – Three and two in the last five meetings. Two and two in the last regular season meetings. Three and one in the last regular season meetings. You have something like eight out of 12 against them or 10 out of 15. I, I don't know. You yeah. have a pretty good record going back a few years. Uh, total 146. Ooh, under. Pushed at 142 in the first meeting. Under 129 in Austin last year. Yeah, that was a low-scoring game. Over 122 and a half. It wasn't that like Lubbock. 61 to 55 or something in Austin? Yep. Good Is pool. that exactly Good right? Good pool. Wow. Hell yeah. Watched that one at Texas Live and then did a hammered people's post game afterwards. <laughs> I was drinking buckets of Coors Light at uh, Texas Live. That was after the return trip to Lubbock, and somehow I was like, I was nervous for the game in Lubbock because I was like, there's just so much anticipation. I was like, man, if you lay an egg, like that'd be so disappointing. But I almost remember feeling like it was double or nothing in Austin. I was like, if we lose, you know, it not it doesn't undo what happened in Lubbock, but I remember just feeling like it was a really high stakes game. Yes. Oh yeah. So anyway, I was glad you won both of them last year. When there was the whole, you know. The ticket fiasco, and it was a fifty yeah. fifty. It was the last game in the Frank Irwin. Like there was a lot of writing on it. Yeah, that's still my favorite factoid. Is um, Red Raiders are responsible for like three the of three the four largest. Crowds, yeah, because a John Denver concert was number one all time, and then Texas Tech in two thousand four and twenty twenty two were like two of their top three basketball crowds of all time. That's pretty awesome. So they always pull that. They're like, oh, we're your Super Bowl. Your fans only show up for Texas. Like, no, your fans only show up for Red Raiders, whether we're singing or playing basketball. Yeah. Ryan says his uh, favorite segment is the final thoughts segment. Yeah. It, yeah. It always uh, gets going again. <laughs> um, Just for funnies, let me see if we have any uh, – Man, I got murdered in my prize picks, Super Bowl prize picks today. Yeah, I did all emotional hedges. I was oh, on like man. Eagles everything. Which all my hurts overs probably cashed, but I was just emotional hedging all the way. I did win a square though. 250 bucks on a square. Solid. Uh, college basketball. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, Kevin O'Banner, 14 and a half points. Under. Uh, Marcus Carr, 16 and a half. Mm, not touching it. Davian Harmon, 13 and a half. Not touching it. Points, rebounds, assists. Davian Harmon, 21 and a half. We'll have to get our friend uh, Tech Hoops guy to th- think on that one. Yeah. He likes Davian Harmon overs when Pop is out. Ooh, assists, three and a half for Harmon. Timmy Allen, six rebounds. Over. And then let's see, uh, Marcus Carr, one and a half, three pointers made. Over. Yeah, that's not his bread and butter, but we're not very good at defending the three either. He's at 23 and a half points, rebounds, assists. Is Tyrese Hunter finally going to have a good game against Texas Tech in his fifth try? Uh, there are no props for him on Prize Picks, but I would bet the under if you if you had the opportunity to. You either go all under or do theory over, and he's going to go off for like twenty six tomorrow. I don't know. Proud of you. Yeah, do theory, big do, do theory. theory guy. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> all right. Uh, I got to do three hours of radio tomorrow, so. Okay. All right. Love y'all. Love y'all.